Okay, so, hello everybody. Um, I'm Connor Abbott. I'm sort of the other half of the Lima team. Um, I am the shader guy, so um, I'll be talking about, whereas Luke was talking more about the community and the stuff he's been doing with the driver, I'll talk about my end um, and the sort of crazy things that you can encounter with Molly shaders um, and Molly instruction set. Um, so, like Luke was mentioning, um, started two years ago, I saw his presentation. Um, he had gotten very far in the command stream stuff, but the one thing he had left out was the compiler. Uh, he was just throwing the shader that he got the source code into the binary compiler, um, getting out some binary format that he had documented, and then using that in his driver. So that wasn't going to work for very long if we wanted to actually have a full open source driver we need to reverse engineer that part. Um, but that was completely separate. So um, I started working on it. Um, and Ben Brewer, who is in the audience right now, also started working on it. Sadly, he's no longer working on it now. But um, we took about six months to reverse engineer the instruction set and sort of figure out what was going on. Um, but it took me one and a half years to write the compiler for this thing. So whereas reverse engineering was the fun part, uh, it was sort of like solving a puzzle, actually writing the compiler was the most difficult part. And that was what was, took the most time and was the most challenging. So the original Molly um, 200 and 400 uh, is not unified architecture. So we have two instruction sets to reverse engineer and write a compiler for that are completely separate. Um, what ARM calls the geometry processor, which runs vertex shaders, and what they call the pixel processor, which runs fragment shaders. Um, so the upcoming, the new stuff, is the T6XX. And I've started to reverse engineer that. Um, so it's partially figured out, um, but we haven't even gotten anywhere on writing a compiler. And um, like Luke said, it's more exploratory at this point. Um, but that's unified architecture, only one thing to reverse engineer. And it's a lot nicer, so it's hopefully a lot less work this time around. So first, first off, um, the 200 and 400 geometry processor. Um, to understand what ARM did with this, you have to realize that it originally, um, at Phalanx, was not designed just for doing vertex shaders. It was actually designed for doing all sorts of multimedia things. And um, oh yeah, it can do vertex shaders as well. So what they chose to go with was a scalar, very large instruction word architecture, where instead of um, operating on vectors, like most GPUs, you have to operate on each scalar unit. And there are a number of independent functional units that um, all operate at the same time. Uh, but there's a huge problem with that. And there's a problem that many of these architectures have encountered in the past. Um, and that's that because all of these units are independent, each of them can read and write to a different number of different register, which means that you have to have, you have to be able to read and write a huge number of registers per cycle. And this is really, really expensive in hardware. So the problem is how do we reduce this? How did how do we get rid of the, or reduce the number of register ports that we need for our hardware? Um, so there have been a number of solutions that have existed already. Um, R600 Radeon is sort of similar in this regard. Um, and what they do is they have a re vector register file like us. Um, and they have sort of complicated restrictions so that each instruction you can only read and write to a certain number of registers. Um, so you can't. They're not fully independent, really. Uh, another example is um, the C6X DSPs. You have two separate um, data paths. And then you can only um, cross over at certain well-defined points. So that also reduces the number of register ports. Um, but the solution that they come up, came up with Phalanx um, is a bit more insane, a bit crazier. So the idea was these register ports are expensive. Um, but we can have a FIFO queue in the hardware, and that's really cheap. And we can have a MUX as well um, to select from different elements of this FIFO queue, and that's really cheap as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep um, a queue of the last few results of each ALU, um, of each operation that's been done. And then we're going to feed back 
uh, those results into the next cycle so that we can cut out most of the register accesses that we would normally perform. Um, so that turns out to be really, really efficient. Um, though this is sort of an example of what that looks like. Um, you have a bunch of ALUs um, as well as a normal register file, but note that you can only read and write one register per cycle. Most of this stuff is going through the FIFO queue, so it's really key that you have to be able to use that in order to be efficient at all. Um, so the question is, how do you write a compiler for this? It's nothing that anybody has really ever done before. Um, so I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, how is this going to work? And I realized that um, the end result, the assembly, is basically passing things directly from one unit to the next. Um, and that's really similar to an idea in compiler theory, this data flow graph, um, which is just a directed acyclic graph where you have operations, and then you can pass data from one operation to the next. So instead of a standard uh, three address IR, which everybody uses, or even a crazy um, tree-based IR, our IR is actually even more crazy. So if you thought that um, that tree-based IR is weird, we have a graph-based IR. Um, so the idea is that we have this graph, and then our scheduler will take care of the restrictions of the actual hardware of, no, this can only be accessed up to two cycles before. Um, so, <laughs> so, but um, this is an example of what the graph would look like. Um, as you can see, the add node has two uses. So this is not an expression tree. This is actually a graph where when it can't be expressed like that. So this is sort of the input to the scheduler, what the intermediate representation in our compiler looks like. Um, and this is how it gets scheduled to the hardware. So the scheduler has taken care of those constraints where now the nodes are assigned to cycles and functional units so that the constraints of this can only be accessed up to two cycles before has been satisfied. So, but there's a problem with this. Um, since we still have register reads and writes, um, there's this issue of, well, if we have a load in a store uh, and it's not entirely clear which of them should be executed first. And if you don't get this correct, then you can change the meaning of the program and your compiler has a bug. Um, and that's not good. So the solution um, is we keep a list of these so-called root nodes, which are side affecting and they don't have any children. So there are things like write registers, um, write to varyings, um, and stuff like that at basically any output. So we keep a list of those and we keep those in order. And then for each non-root node, for each thing that might be like add two things or load a varying or something like that or load a uniform, we keep track of which is the earliest root node that accesses it, that uses that value. Um, and we call that its successor node. So, and then we order things with respect to the root nodes so that um, we order things with respect to the root nodes so that um, every non-root node um, knows where in the instruction stream it is. And so as far as the compiler is concerned, each uh, node runs immediately before a successor node. So in our example before, um, there is basically a line drawn in the compiler between the store R0 node and then everything that comes after it um, is run immediately before the store R1 node. And then when we go to run the scheduler, we have to insert a fake dependency between the store R0 node, store register 0 node there, and the load register 0 node there, so that it's scheduled in the correct order. Um, so our scheduler, um, it seems at first to be pretty standard. Um, we schedule all of the root nodes, all of the nodes. We schedule backwards, starting at the end, um, and then when you schedule a node, you look at what nodes may be free now because all of its dependencies are scheduled, and then you keep doing that until the queue of nodes that are left to be scheduled is empty. However, 
um, there's a bit of a hitch in that there's not only a minimum latency constraint, there's also a maximum latency constraint with, because most of these queues are only too deep. You can only schedule things up to two cycles away. So what the solution there is to sort of thread move nodes so that um, an access up here can get to, or an uh, operation up here can get to its use down all the way down there. And so we thread these moves nodes in between. Um, and if that doesn't work, if we run out of room to thread and move nodes, then we have to use registers. So we essentially spill to the register. Uh, so this is an example. Say that we have um, this graph here and we want to schedule it. And we've scheduled all the blue nodes and we want to schedule the red one. So it's on, it has to be um, within two cycles of all of its uses, but as you can see, um, that's impossible. Of the four possible places we could put, of it, put it, none of them satisfy the constraints. And this isn't something that you see with a normal scheduler. So the solution um, is to insert it uh, as close as we can so that everything can still see it, the result, basically. And then we insert a move node so that um, anything we didn't reach is then reached. So the blue node down there can get the same result. Uh, and as it turns out, um, I thought it was going to be pretty easy. Um, in the round of the time of Faustum last year, I was working on this. Um, and it turned out, as it turned out, there were tons and tons of edge cases that I hadn't considered or hadn't figured out how to do. And it took a lot of time to get that scheduler to work properly. Um, and there's also tons of weird interactions with the register scheduling where if you, you need to, sometimes you need to spill the registers, but how are you going to get those registers? Um, if you do it after register scheduling, then how are you going to get them? If you do it before regis register allocation, then the register allocator might need to spill things and you need to reschedule. So there's lots of things you need to figure out to do this compiler, this crazy hardware. Um, so next, the pixel processor. Um, this one is as insane of a an hardware architecture, uh, but as it turns out, <laughs> the compiler is a lot easier. Um, it's so much easier to do. So it's a vector architecture as compared to the GP. It operates essentially on vectors. Um, it's a barreled architecture like most GPUs. The difference, though, is that they take it to the extreme. We have a 128-stage pipeline um, running hundreds of threads at once. <laughs> and there's actually a separate program counter per fragment. We have to explicitly synchronize them if we want to exchange data, like with derivatives or texture fetches. Um, and it seems really insane from the hardware level, but it's really nice from the compiler level because we get fully dynamic branching. We get all the traditional stuff that's been built up for CPUs over the last 30 years that's normally not applicable to GPUs. Uh, so how do those 128 stages get absolutely mapped to something that um, the compiler writer will see? As it turns out, there are 12 what we call units or subpipelines that are enabled in the ISA that you can see. And in, uh, from the compiler writers or from the ISA's point of view, it's basically like you can execute those 12 subpipelines in one cycle sequentially. So each construction in, consists of a 32-bit control word um, that encodes the instruction length and which units you're going to use in that instruction. And then you have a packed bit field of, word, of commands to each instruction, to each unit. Um, and as it turns out, those commands are packed because they're sometimes odd lengths. On one's 31 bits, 63 bits, um, and that was as you can imagine, that was a ton of fun to reverse engineer. So um, the pipeline um, from the compiler writer's point of view, this is very simplified, but it looks something like this. Um, so basically, uh, the scalar multiply and vector multiply happen in the same cycle, um, happen at the same time, and the same thing as scalar add and vector add. But um, to 
the compiler writer to someone who's doing assembly, basically those stages get run sequentially per each instruction. And you can do that all in one cycle, uh, which is very, very easy to write a compiler for. You just smash them together, and it works. Um, so our compiler architecture is two parts, sort of for historical reasons. I think Ben had started writing this compiler for the PP. Um, as I realized very quickly that it wasn't going to work very well, but rather than rewriting it, um, I started develop, modifying it to something that we call PPHIR. Um, so it's SSA based, and this is where any specific optimizations happen, um, lowering of operations into stuff the hardware can support. Um, and at the very end, um, each instruction in the HIR represents exactly one of these stages. Um, and then where we combine the stages is LIR. So that's the low-level IR where each instruction maps exactly to one hardware instruction. So that's where we do scheduling. That's where we do register allocation. Um, and that's where we do any hardware-specific things, like passing things directly um, between stages, because the hardware has some special what we call pipeline registers, so that you can do that. And that reduces the register pressure, because rather than saving things in registers, you can just pass through from one pipeline unit to the next. Uh, so HIR, um, first of all, the first thing to do is lower from whatever input. In this case, it's going to be GLSLIR from Intel's compiler, uh, which isn't the part that is basically the part that isn't done yet. We need to convert that to SSA because our representation is SSA. Um, I've been doing some work on the Intel compiler to uh, have that be an SSA form. And hopefully, that means that our HIR work, we don't need to do that in there. And in fact, for the GP, our IR is SSA based as well. Um, and so doing all that work in Mesa instead of in our driver is going to mean a lot less work for us. And hopefully, the Intel guys will maintain it for us. <laughs> um, so then we lower to LIR. And in LIR, we have a very naive translation, one-to-one -one translation of the instructions in the high-level IR. So then we do things like load store forwarding, which um, is basically because we can do all this stuff in one cycle. Let's say we have a varying load instruction and then vary various things that use that. If we can duplicate that instruction and move it into each of the instructions that use it, um, even though we're loading the varying many different times, in the end, we've saved an instruction. So we want to do low-level things like that. Uh, and that saves with register. That helps save registers. Uh, we also want to replace normal registers with pipeline registers. And we need to do that before register allocation so that um, we can see that savings in register allocation. Then we schedule for register pressure because um, all these optimizations are helping with register pressure, too, because spilling is very power expensive. You have to go to this huge cache, um, and it's not, it, all, it might be fast because of this whole um, idea of hiding latency and running hundreds of threads at once so that you don't stall the pipeline, but it's still very power expensive. And we only have six registers, which may seem small, um, but when you consider that there are hundreds of threads running at once. It's actually quite a lot of registers. So we do, then next we do register allocation um, and we do register coalescing, which is um, just getting rid of moves by trying to allocate things in the same space. Uh, then we try and combine these instructions. So we've done it, we've tried to combine instructions smartly um, before. Now we just do it the dumb way. We just try and smash things together and see if it can fit. Um, and that's basically what happens. Uh, so the T6XX, I got a Samsung Chrome very early on. Um, I actually haven't been using it that much. I ran ARM's instructions for their driver, and it was, it was bad. Um, but and as it turns out, they also have an offline compiler, um, so that from the safety of relative safety of my laptop, I can take some source code, 
compile the shader, um, and then run it through my disassembler and see what patterns come out, and then start to reverse engineer things. So the, uh, it turns out that the architecture here is somewhat similar to the Mali 200 and 400 pixel processor. It's, the difference is that they've taken that huge pipeline and they've split it into three parts. Um, the arithmetic part, um, the load store part, and the texture fetching part. Um, so now each pipeline is smaller. It's not as insane anymore. Um, but you still have this barreled architecture. And you still have um, a separate program counter per thread, per uh, fragment. So um, another nice thing about this is that the number of ALU pipelines to load store and texture pipelines is now configurable. So if you have a really compute intensive application where you want to use tons and tons of ALUs, you can do that. You can have up to, I think, eight ALUs per load store and texture unit. Um, or if you're more graphics intensive, if you want to do graphics things as opposed to compute, you can have only two ALUs per load store and texture unit. Um, and you can modify the hardware to do it, um, whatever job you want, more efficiently. Uh, so basically, this is what we've figured out so far. It's not much. Um, as it turns out, ARM was a lot more open about patents this time. There are basically no patents on the stuff that I described before, at least none that I can find. But um, for the T6XX, there are tons more. Um, and the picture they give is something like this, um, based on the patents and some initial reverse engineering work. Um, so it's a stream of instructions. Each instruction, uh, you have the pipeline which you're running it on, and you have the size of the instruction. As it turns out, ALU words are similar to what instructions were on the pixel processor. You have this control word with a bit field enabling which uh, ALUs you're going to use. Uh, load store words and texture words are completely different, though. And there's a lot of stuff added to that. Um, I only have the offline compiler, which doesn't support ES3 shaders yet, so I haven't dived into that. I need to get my Chromebook working to, to do that. Um, but there's still a lot more work to do there. So that's basically what it looks like, or what we've figured out so far. Um, actually, if you look at the earlier slide for the pixel processor, the ALU word looks very, very similar. Um, the only difference is that they've swapped the scalar pipeline, so you do add first instead of multiply. And they've added support for a ton and tons of new things. So now it's 128 bits instead of 64 bits. Um, you have a bunch of stuff for OpenCL support. You have a bunch of stuff for ES3 support, like actual support for integers and um, atomics in the load store unit and tons of new texture formats and all that fun sort of stuff. Um, but in the end, the design is kind of similar. So the ideas are similar, um, but it's different enough that we can't really share any code between the compilers. So what's left to do? Um, as Luke mentioned, we have to get my stuff working with his Mesa stuff. Um, and hopefully my work with SSA will make that go a bit smoother. Um, we actually need to uh, test our, the back end that I've been working on for this past year and a half with actual real world shaders. That's a bit difficult because we can only support ES2 and there aren't very many real world shaders that use it or many complex real-world shaders that use ES2. Um, and obviously, we need to keep working on T6XX. Um, hopefully, we're pretty close to getting something working um, for the old stuff, which means we can move on to the new stuff, um, hopefully in the near future. So that's it. And any questions? Someone somehow was able to port open OpenCL or something similar for older Mali graphic cards? It doesn't support 85% of the features you need. Yep. <laughs> it so doesn't support integers. Um, it, there are two separate pipelines, and the PP only is 
uh, supports 16-bit vary, 16-bit floating point, whereas you need 632 really. Um, and you need to be able to load store. You need Atomics, um, which is added with the load store pipeline in the T6XX and a whole host of other things, really, unfortunately. Thanks.